Welcome to Missing Persons Uncovered. I'm Caroline Humer, a child protection expert, and in this podcast series, we seek to understand the complexities of a global issue. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people go missing worldwide. I'm Karen Shalev Green, and I carry out research into missing persons at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Across this series, Caroline and I are talking to professionals to share insights into how we can all be more aware and take action to protect vulnerable people in our communities and families from going missing. In this episode, Karen talks to Frank Ledwich, who is the senior lecturer at the UK Portsmouth University, focused on military strategy. He shared his experience on finding people missing from war and the unique challenges he has faced. He was a military who serviced during the Balkan War and worked at the British Foreign Office as a missing person officer. An ongoing conflict is highly confusing and stressful for everybody involved in it. Keep your ID with you as far as you can. Now, of course, in a much more wired world, keeping your phone on you if you can and a battery charged. Thank you very much for agreeing to join us for this podcast. We're really interested in understanding going missing in war situations. The majority of the podcast looks at day-to-day events that lead people to going missing and some of the search and rescue involving those types of scenarios but we also want to include obviously larger scale events that are relevant to many people around the world. Well it's great to be here Karen and thank you for inviting me it's a huge honour. I'm senior lecturer in military strategy at Portsmouth where I've worked for seven years and I work on a contract we have with the Royal Air Force to help teach their personnel. We teach them strategy and law and we do our own research as well. Prior to that, I was a barrister for seven years in the UK and specifically in Liverpool, where I'm from. And then I'd taken an interest in the military and joined the reserve forces in the early 90s. And when the Balkan Wars started, I was called up to go there to serve as a soldier and actually as a military intelligence officer. So that's a sort of field intelligence officer. And your job there is to find out in your area essentially what's going on, what threats there are, and to get a picture for your commanders. In Bosnia, where we were at the time, there was particular concern about the return of refugees about war crimes was another one and that was my focus. So I did that for three or four years and also spent two years employed by the British Foreign Office as a missing persons officer. And then I spent seven years with the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, in Albania and the former Soviet Union. I worked in all the former Soviet states except Turkmenistan. And then I spent some time in Afghanistan with the British mission, also as a soldier in Iraq. Again, got called up. Again, I had some experience there of missing issues. And Libya. And I spent also some time over the summer as a visiting fellow for a think tank in Ukraine, where I got some awareness of what was going on in the missing persons field as well. Frank explains further what he has experienced in the late 1990s and the kind of missing person processes he has encountered. I got involved initially in Bosnia, doing that that military work. The area I was working in was North Bosnia, where, as the listeners may know, the most famous of all massacres in Europe took place since the Second World War, took place in a place called Srebrenica. But Srebrenica wasn't the only place. There were many others where fewer people were killed, but which obviously were of equal significance to the victims' families. And so my introduction to this came actually meeting the women of Srebrenica, or some of the women of Srebrenica, in 1996. And they were the remaining relatives. It was just a year or so after the massacre had taken place where Serbian forces had surrounded the town. They had separated the men and the women. And if that happens, you always know that there's very likely to be killing in in this kind of civil conflict. And there was between seven and 8,000 men were taken away and they were shot systematically and buried and then reburied, it turned out. But at that time, these almost everyone was still missing and efforts had only just begun to find the dead as everyone, except really the families, accepted. So the kind of conversations we had there, which I found quite curious at the time but fully understand now, with the women of Srebrenica, were what they wanted us to do was to establish the whereabouts of their men the missing men and they were convinced because they'd heard rumors that the Serbian state had mines all these people were employed in mines or that they were somehow in a prison camp 
and the accounts of, that they'd heard, needless to say, and I think in their hearts knew were true, but the accounts of the mass murders were untrue, and at least some people survived. And these were often egged on by either opportunists or simple malicious who would be telling them. I saw Osman in a, a mine in near Niche or wherever it happened to be, or I saw X or Y in a in a road in, in Belgrade, accompanied by two men. So that was my my st- start into this. As I said, my interest in that, or rather professional interest in that, was at that point was more for the arrest and apprehension, or the discovery and apprehension of the people who'd done all these crimes, which we were quite successful in doing. But much more relevant to the discussion was my appointment as missing persons officer in Kosovo in 1998 by the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. I was working for the British government there and it was one of those needs must events where we found that in the town, relatively small town that our little team were based, there were about 200 missing people. There were two communities living in this, Serbians and Kosovo and Albanians, and there were significant numbers on either side. So both sides appealed to us to liaise with the other side to discover the whereabouts of these people. And we had much the same thing, where there were rumours that these had been taken to a camp or a mine or taken over the border into Albania in one case or into Serbia in the other, which uh, arose time and time again. And what we found out very quickly, I think, through speaking to more realistic people who weren't directly involved, and that's the key thing. People directly involved are often, as you well know, very reluctant to accept that their relatives may be dead. We established fairly quickly the high likelihood was that most of these were dead. And then we discovered that this pattern was replicated all over the province. And it became, as time went on over the years I was there, the missing persons issue established a vital and rather central political position. Because the missing persons on both sides were used as a political weapon to attack the other side. That's really insightful and I completely understand the process that it takes to see how the impact on families can also be used as a political instrument, which we don't see really on day-to-day disappearances. It's a very different layer, I think, for, for people to deal with. We may think we understand what a war looks like. However, Frank describes how difficult it actually is to define what we mean by war. Well, as someone with a doctorate in war studies, you would think that I'd be able to come to an adequate answer about that. And uh, the answer is I really can't because it depends, and that's an academic answer, isn't it? But the, the answer to your question, in practical terms, generally speaking, is a conflict in which more than a thousand people a year are killed, which is quite an inhuman definition, but there it is. But I mean, nowadays, it's a fairly old definition. When you have a situation like in Mexico, where there are now how many murders a year? Is it 30,000, I think? I'm not sure. It's a huge number. And these are between groups and gangs, often against the government. Is that a conflict, a war? or a set of criminal activities. And those categories, of course, shade over into the other. A war is also de- defined, needless to say, as a conflict between states. That would exclude Afghanistan from that. I think that's a false definition. So that answer, I think, is a political conflict causing high casualties, which would tend to exclude, for the most part, something like Mexico in de- definitional terms, though in practical terms really makes no difference since you have large groups of armed people going around fighting each other, just not in that case for political reasons. That's a very poor answer, but unfortunately that, that reflects the practical situation. And how many people do you think, if you take that definition that you into account, try to give us as best as you can, how many people around the world do you think that impacts? Well, impacting directly, the answer would be tens of millions. So I'm not going to include Mexico in this. But directly, directly impl- implicates. Let me give you some figures, but no, none of your listeners will be surprised. Let's take the war on terror. So the war on terror has cost, according to Brown University, and I wrote a book actually on the cost, direct cost to Afghanistan, which is only one component of it. So it's about 930,000 people are killed, 30 million displaced in the wars on terror in Pakistan, Yemen, and of course, needless to say, Iraq and Afghanistan. But going on now, we have the largest or most deadly conflict in the world now is in northwestern Ethiopia, something in the region of half a million people, that's a credible figure, have died over the last two or three years of that terrible conflict, of whom 100,000 
have been killed in conflict and others in other ways, including starvation, displacement, forced displacement, etc. Then, of course, as the war in Ukraine has cost something, I, I would suggest so far in the region of, well, no less than 100,000 combat casualties and tens of thousands of civilian casualties, with another 5 to 10 million, depending on how you define it, certainly 5 million at least displaced from that conflict. I'm not, I haven't included countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the deadliest war in the last 30 years, killing in multiple millions. It's Africa's first world war, it was called, with several iterations and one going on now, which is more like a commercial conflict fought by mercenaries and gangsters and terrorist groups. Finally, the displaced figure for the war on terror is 38 million. So many tens of millions are affected by war, even now, as we speak, in the contemporary wars. It has a vast impact on the people of the world, and we see it almost everywhere. With so many people affected by war, Frank shares with us how persons go missing during war. I'm going to use the Ukraine example for this. So in Ukraine, because it's contemporary and it provides a lamentable example relatively close to home, but all of these factors apply everywhere in every kind of conflict, including the ones that Western armed forces are involved in. So first of all, you can simply be forcibly forcibly displaced. You find, I ask your listeners to consider where they live now, where they are when they're listening to this, and what would happen if they're not already involved in war or conflict, were foreign or, or hostile armed men, mostly men, to be reported two or three miles away, and there to be rumours of killings, or, or indeed you can hear the artillery or shooting. And what are you going to do? So you're going to leave home. So that's the first way you leave home. You don't necessarily leave a record of where you've gone, and you become either a displaced person internally in the country or a refugee if you cross borders. And a low proportion of refugees or displaced people are recorded as such. That's the first way. Now, you can have a, a variation on that because then the armed men show up in your village and they kick you out of your house. And they take you away somewhere. And that's happened in Ukraine to very large numbers of people who have been displaced to Russia or kidnapped, actually, to Russia. It's not to say that all of them have been placed in camps or anything like that. That's almost certainly happened. But more likely, people would simply dumped over the border or taken on trains somewhere and told to get on with their lives somewhere else. I think in that case, you could define it probably as ethnic cleansing of some kind. But again, that's a different category. So you can be forcibly displaced. And, and, and that, if your relatives have no record of where you've gone, and most people won't, you may have your phone taken off, you may run out of battery, you may have no access to communications for weeks or months, then you become a missing person. No one will know where you are. There are many thousands of people like that in the current Ukraine conflict. I think there are very few, by the way, few Russians who have had that happen to them by Ukrainian forces can happen, I suppose, perhaps if the war goes very well for, for Ukraine, but until now that has not happened. This has been an entire activity entirely carried on by the Russians, forced displacement. And uh, without recording those people, you become missing. So then the next step up the ladder of horror is being kidnapped and uh, held hostage, essentially. And clearly, if you're a hostage, eventually you're presence will be revealed but a lot of people are just kidnapped off the street and are never seen again and that was the case when I was in Kosovo that's what happened to very many of the missing people in I was dealing with in Kosovo they're simply rounded up and taken away and uh, never seen again which is, is kidnapped again that no record of where you go and many of those people will be killed deliberately and they will be buried without record in ditches or indeed burned want to go into that, to that too much. In mass killings or individual killings, well, we'll see it in every conflict, be it uh, in Ireland or in much larger scales elsewhere. And in all those cases, if your relatives, those who loved ones, don't know where you are, you become, you become missing. And there are definitions to what missing is, but that's how it happens. So in ascending scale, displacement, forced displacement, uh, imprisonment, kidnap, deliberate killing, the last two often imply, not always implies deliberate killing. We talked about how civilians are displaced during war, but how do governments search and recover soldiers who are missing? Well, just to give you an indication, there are still, at the end of the Second World War, there were 78,000 American combatants missing. Now, there aren't that number now because Americans put huge efforts into finding every missing soldier. But that gives you an idea, since that would be that would range at around 10% of the entire casualty total in the Second World War. So very many soldiers go missing. And the reason they go missing is because their bodies get lost, essentially. We still have thousands of missing from the First World War as well in Europe. Now, today in Ukraine, the nature of the combat and the condition of the dead will make it very difficult short of DNA identification to 
identify bodies. But great care is taken. The Red Cross tries to ensure this the International Committee of the Red Cross, who essentially define and, and I won't say regulate, but they're the leading de- definers of international humanitarian law. And also on the ground, they do their best to promote and to a lesser extent enforce this. What they try and do is they try and make sure that everybody can be identified. Before combat, everyone has a, a dog tag, which you wear on you. You're, you're obviously registered by your unit. And if you're killed, then that will be part of it will be taken off you and you can be identified. And what should happen is that your enemy it will help with that and they will take your dog tag and register your death. The Geneva Conventions require that that happens so that graves registration, that when you're buried, you're, you're buried in somewhere where you can be found again on both sides. I don't know that it's done in Ukraine. I've no reason to believe, certainly by the Ukrainians, that it is not done that way. And then what happens is you are reported through the Red Cross to the other side as being killed in action, or at least that's one of the ways it can be done. So that's how you go missing. You go missing through being killed, and there are millions of soldiers from the Second World War on all sides, Second World War and indeed every war who face that fate. So combatants as well can go missing. They're, they're, they're generally in combat. And one other thing, it's vitally important as a preventative measure. One of the, one of the priorities of the ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, is prevention of people going missing. So we've already outlined some of the ways they recommend to do that. That's making sure everyone who serves can be recognised, they have a dog tag, they're captured, then immediately they're taken prisoner and then they're, they're, they're fed into the system. What they try and ensure, what all competent armed forces try and ensure, is that when you take prisoners, you register them immediately. So once they're in the system, they're safe. What happens then is that you get reported to up the chain of command and the chain of command then report your status as a missing, ideally as a missing person to the National Information Bureau in any given country. The National Information Bureau then communicate with the Red Cross, who then communicates with the other side so that your relatives know you're a prisoner of war and from being missing in action, you now become alive in a prisoner of war and safe. So if you're, you're given that status, you're safe. And I'm certain the Ukrainians are doing that now doing their best anyway and certainly the Red Cross are doing that in every conflict. We are talking about large numbers and the idea of preventative measures is something we would always want to highlight so Mm. is this something that civilians in these situations can do when they find themselves about to be displaced or fear kidnapped to mark their identity somehow in a safe way? The only avenue I can think of is you make sure you keep some form of identity on you those who are kidnapped, as you know, very sometimes told to, to get rid of it, but depends who you're kidnapped by, to deny nationality or try and make it difficult for the kidnappers. In the case of civilians, you, it's vital that you establish your civil status, and that means your citizenship and your identity. And so you have to keep that with you, you should keep your ID with you as far as you can. Now, of course, in a much more wired world, keeping your phone on you, if you can, and battery charged so that if necessary, in, in appropriately equipped societies, you can be tracked, but also that you have the ability somehow to communicate. And I think in future, that'll be as electronics become miniaturized, that, that, that'll be far easier than it is now. But it's vital that you maintain your, your civil status. I don't mean civilian status. By civil status, I mean your identity and who you are and where you're from. So that the Red Cross can, can register you if necessary. They're going to ask you, you know, who you are and you'll be disbelieved. It makes it a lot easier for everybody if you have your civil status documents on you. That's what I would suggest that in, in a conflict zone. You always have your ID ready to go if, if you're next in that situation. I hope nobody's in that situation is listening to this, but that, that's essential. Keep your ID on you. And there are other reasons for that as well, much more morbid ones, that in the event you're killed, God forbid, then you, your identity will be on you. And I, I've found several times people who have their ID on them and they can be returned to their relatives very quickly. So obviously, given the level of violence that we are talking about, it sounds one of the most challenging environments then to finding people who are missing. So can you highlight maybe a few of the key challenges that you've yeah. seen? The first, if you go missing, so we'll, we'll look at this from the perspective of the families. It's the families dominating for the rest of their lives until you're found. That's going to be your close one's primary objective is to find you because being missing is worse than being dead for families, in my view. The the You die every day. So that creates a great deal of psychological pain and confusion in families, and also a highly and understandable resistance for sometimes for years to accepting that your loved one is not coming back. 
So that's the first thing. Even if you accept that, then the task becomes finding the loved one's body, which is where forensic science and forensic anthropology and all those things come in from a practical perspective. So an ongoing conflict is highly confusing and stressful for everybody involved in it. I've been in three or four of those ongoing conflict in the middle of them and in three involved in looking for missing people. So you have families who are confused, extremely angry, needless to say at those who and the entire community of those who kidnapped their loved ones, but also at your own authorities who may or may not be sincere in trying to find the missing. And it that does not create an entirely rational environment within which the search can take place. And it's highly emotional. It makes it very difficult to deliver bad news if you have it. When you're involved with search for missing people, you're trying to negotiate with the other side, perhaps for the return of bodies or the exchange of bodies. So I'll give you an example just of how difficult it can be. I'll call him George. So George's brother, let's call him Michael, had been kidnapped. And we discovered with a high degree of certainty what had happened to him, but we couldn't find his body. And we knew the area, but we simply couldn't find it. And there were 30 or 40 others that we found out similar information about from sources. So we found out all these people had been killed and buried in a particular area, including Michael, George's brother. Our challenge was, do we tell them this in this case? For weeks, we decided not to because the political cost in terms of the risk of revenge captures and killings was too great, which would have given space for extremists to get in and claim even worse atrocities, perhaps, or simply cause even worse trouble than was happening in this particularly brutal war. A year further on, we came back and the war was changed in nature. And I thought, okay, look, it's time now for those people I know well to know. And so I took George out for a drink. Uh, we, we got on very well. And I said to George, look, George, the truth is that, that Michael won't be coming home. What do you mean Michael won't be coming home, George? He's, he's dead. He was killed on this date in this time by this unit. Are you sure? I'm as, as near as sure as I can be. Ah, but you're not sure. He's not coming home. He's dead. And he said, well, if you're not sure, I can't be sure either. And there was no convincing him that this is what happened. And, and, and I can multiply that case by many others, some told more formally. And until the bodies were found, I don't think George's and Michael's body was ever found, then there will always be that doubt. But the political risk was always present. What happens if you, if you deliver news like that, and then the next day there's a revenge killing? And what kind of responsibility have you discharged then, particularly if you can't prove what has happened? It's also quite difficult in a, in a, in a dynamic conflict situation where perhaps the, the Red Cross is completely overworked because they, they deploy, you know, they don't have armies of people. And often this kind of work is devolved to international organizations or local human rights groups. And there are many bodies to be dealing with that are found all the time, perhaps after a war, and where no official will take responsibility for the disposal of both bodies. And that can be quite distressing. And there are hundreds or thousands of missing people. There are mass graves that focuses on them, but less so on the more individual cases where bodies are found, we're unable to identify them. And it, t it takes a long time to cohere the organization to be able to, to organize the recovery identification and decent handling of, of the dead, who, who, of course, until they were found, were missing. The fact is that unless preparations are made well in advance of, say, a peacekeeping force deploying or indeed just deployed prior to the end of a war to search for and deal with the dead and missing, as I said to you, until people are found, they are missing, then the situation will be chaotic. And I think what it may, be, it may well be in Ukraine, in some of the towns in Ukraine, that that's when the war finishes, God willing, it will soon, that's what we'll find. Just to give you an example of perhaps t some towns in Ukraine now who suffered severe crimes and there are hundreds of dozens or hundreds of missing people. And at first, the international media circus will appear, the forensic scientists will appear, the ICC, International Criminal Court and all that. When they leave, there may be dozens or hundreds of people that have not been identified and won't be identified for years afterwards uh, until the criminal justice mechanism takes its turn. The result is, all too often, you know, as time goes on, it's much more difficult to get registrations for DNA and so forth. For example, in Kosovo, there are 1,700 people who are still missing 
and there are, I think, many hundreds of unidentified bodies. In Bosnia, of the 40,000 who went missing, 30,000 are now identified, and there are at least 7,000 who are not, and are still missing. And their bodies are either find in, in marked graves or lie unidentified in unmarked graves. And it can be extremely chaotic, and I don't want to characterise the whole effort like that, but it can be very chaotic, highly emotional, and often not result in an optimum result. Frank's experience highlights the great challenges war brings to finding people. What kind of good practices are there to increase the reunification of families? Of course, there are exceptional organizations working all the time to put some order into that. And there are two in particular who are heroic in this. They are the Red Cross, the International Committee of the Red Cross, who have as their remit the essentially enforcing the right of people to know in international law, to know the fate of their relatives. And the Red Cross are exceptional at and have been exceptional for the last 150 years in setting standards to ensure you know, preventative measures and to ensure that in or after a conflict, insofar as they, they can, the fate of the missing is notified to relatives. And they do that particularly through mechanisms such as the Central Tracing Agency in Geneva. They act as a sort of neutral broker between uh, countries. So, for example, as between Russia and Ukraine, they will liaise with the various bureau, the National Information Bureau of each country, to establish the fate of prisoners to the extent they can missing the persons. And they're doing that every day of every year and right now. Is that just in Europe? Because you mentioned in Geneva and there's the tracing agency works across the world. The tracing agency works across the world. The second organisation, and there are many, many, many more, but the second major, major organisation is the International Commission for Missing Persons, ICMP. Now, what they do is they are focused, although not exclusively, on the establishing of accountability. They are exceptionally good at advising on legal frameworks in particular countries and mechanisms for what are called so-called missing persons mechanisms, which very often are set, are always set up in conflict countries. Missing persons mechanisms are the formal mechanisms and sometimes informal mechanisms whereby someone who is missing becomes someone who is identified and returned to their loved ones. And they're quite complex mechanisms. The ICRC work on them as well and have a set of accepted international standards ICMP do their very best alongside ICRC to implement those in practice. And perhaps, and not everybody would agree with this, I think one exceptional European example of how this was done, it took a long time for political reasons, structural reasons and legal reasons to get it right. But if you look at the results and the continuing results against huge headwinds was Bosnia, where well over, I think, three quarters of the missing people in a, in a terribly difficult political situation have been found. And it's taken 25 years or thereabouts from the war to do it. So Bosnia is a pretty good example of how, in a highly fractious environment, mechanisms were put together and made to work. So yes, good examples do exist. But what it takes is the ability to, I think, foreground and make preparations for these mechanisms when the conflict is going on. And I hope that's being done in Ukraine now, and I think it is to the extent that it can be. One other thing on this, a practical thing, which I'm sure I know you'll appreciate and many of your listeners will, is just the availability of forensic resources. So in a country like Ukraine, before the war, you have a limit, highly limited forensic science source. There are only so many forensic scientists, DNA assessors and registration, those who can take registrations and so forth that exist, forensic anthropologists. And many of those will be deployed to the battlefield to identify the dead. And the forensic science capability for, let's say, criminal purposes is, is somewhat diminished. So you have these practical headwinds. And so what happens is that people may not be identified very quickly. And there's not too much you can do about that aspect of things because you're so resource constrained. But what you can do is begin to set up your missing persons mechanism during the conflict, harmonizing ministerial roles, the highest levels, so everybody knows their responsibilities, who is responsible for investigation, who is responsible for registration, documentation. Where is a central database to be located? That's very important, having a central database for the missing, so that there aren't multiple databases that perhaps conflict with each other. But let's not diminish the central strategic problem, and that is when in a conflict, missing persons aren't necessarily everybody's priority in a way that they absolutely will be after the conflict. 
there's a very low realization, I think, during a conflict that of the vastly important status that missing persons will take after a conflict where it becomes extremely political. And the return of the missing becomes central to often a nation's consciousness. My purpose is to simply try and indicate the importance that missing persons, competence and non-competence, take on after a conflict. Thank you. It's been really insightful. It's, it's hard going and it's very, very raw topic for many people. It's important to discuss. I don't think that people quite understand or are exposed to what that means unless they're in that situation. And looking from the outside is always very different. So thank you for giving us an insider's view to the efforts of locating and trying to bring people to their families. Thank you for your efforts personally and, and that of your colleagues for making missing persons generally something worth and vital. And I think it's inspiring what you've done. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Missing Persons Uncovered. And thank you, Frank, for your insight into how people who are missing during war are being looked at and the complexity in reuniting them with their loved ones. If you have any questions you would like us to answer or thoughts on topics you would like us to discuss, please contact us through our website. If you'd like specific information or need help, please reach out to your local police department or national charity. If you are enjoying this podcast and discussion, please help support us by buying us a coffee through missingpersonsuncovered.com. I'm Karen Shalev Green. And I'm Caroline Humer. Thank you for listening. Join us next time when we will talk to Jeff Newis from the UK about people going missing on a night out.